Second only to the Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. He was also the wealthiest man who ever lived. And at the height of Solomon's wealth and Solomon's wisdom, he pins the words of Proverbs chapter 6. I want to take this book, this chapter, this collection of verses, and break them into two separate and distinct pieces. Because within the limited framework of these verses, Solomon warns us that periodically we need to put ourselves in check. Uh, I, I, I have met some people who will lie to you. Uh, what is worse is when you lie to yourself. Uh, there was one man, he, he kept telling the lie that he had a horse uh, and he lied about having a horse so much until he went out and bought a saddle and didn't even own a horse. Sometimes we've got to look inwardly and check ourselves because at the end of verse 15, the warning is if you do not self-correct that ruination is on its way to your doorstep, and it will be a ruination that is beyond repair. Such strong language is given in verse 12, really all the way down to verse 19. So because the language of the passage is strong, the language of the message may be a little stronger than normal too. You all right with that? It might be a little stronger. All right, here's point number one for the deep saints. Here's point number one. You ain't that slick. You ain't that slick. The, the, the problem with a whole lot of underhanded people, Burkini, uh, is that they think that nobody sees their underhandedness. When the reality is God sees you, we see you if we have been given the spirit of discernment. Pa parents, uh, I want you to continue to pray that your children will do well in school. That's important. I want you to continue to pray that your children will make right and righteous decisions. That's important. I want to recommend that you add something to your prayer life. Pray that God will give your children discernment. Discernment is when you can look at a thing that looks sweet, but see the sour on the inside of it. Discernment is when you can, when you can tell the difference between heroes and zeros. Because sometimes they look the same from the outside. And you need some discernment. We all do. We need some discernment. And for slick underhanded people they behave as though nobody sees them nobody knows what they are up to but the reality is we see you God sees you and through the spirit of discernment we're able to understand the intentions that are in your heart watch what Solomon says in verse 12 through verse 16 or, or verse 15. I, I, I love the fact that he start off calling names. Riff, raff, and rascals. <laughs> this is the Message Bible uh, edited by Reverend Dr. Eugene Peterson, who just less than a year ago went home to be with the Lord. It is called a paraphrase where he takes the word of God and places it uh, in uh, modern language, easier for us to understand. And he says that riffraff and rascals, uh, if we were writing this in Lachua County in the 352, we would say trifling hood rat. Trifling people. You know some trifling people. 
They trifling in person. They trifling online. Always caught up in something. The text refers to them as riffraff and rascals. How can you spot them? Well, first of all, they talk out of both sides of their mouths. That means they will tell you one thing on Monday morning uh, and tell your neighbor something completely different around Monday afternoon. They are riffraff rascals who talk out of both sides of their mouths. He presses it further. And he, watch this. He is so descriptive, Tam, in the language until what he is trying to get us to reveal or what he is revealing to us is that these riffraff and rascals think that nobody sees them. But the reality is anyone with discernment knows what you're up to because we can spot the symptoms. The first one is you talk out of both sides of your mouth. Because I heard you say one thing to me and then you walked off and I heard you say something completely different to the next person. And you act like I didn't hear you. What else do they do? They wink at each other. They shuffle their feet. Uh, it literally means they use their feet to send signals to other riffraff and rascals. They cross their fingers behind their backs. You can't trust nothing that they say. Watch this. Their perverse minds are always cooking up something nasty. Always stirring up trouble. Riff raff. Rascals. Trifling. Do you know some? Is you one? Somebody says, I passed as horrible grandma. Are you one of them? Are you a riffraff rascal? Here's why it is so important to preach this. Catastrophe is just around the corner for them. A total smash up, their lives ruined beyond repair. See, if I can help someone as I pass along, if I can cheer someone with a word or song, if I can convince a brother or sister when they're traveling wrong, the songwriter says, then my labor will not be in vain. Bottom line, you ain't that slick. We see you. God sees you. And through discernment, we can look through your false face and see the reality of your human heart. You ain't that slick. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here. You've been scheming, conniving, setting traps, making plans, and you think nobody knows. Here's the word of God to you this morning. We see you. God sees you. Because there's one thing about low down slick folks, you can't hide it long. Because sometimes people tell lies and forget all the lies that they told. A, a, a lady one day was standing, this is the truth for God, a lady was standing before, standing at, in the line at Walmart uh, at the uh, checkout counter. She had given the cashier a credit card uh, and the uh, cashier was calling the woman's name based on the credit card she had given them and the lady wouldn't answer. She said, Miss Williams, Miss Williams, and the lady wouldn't answer. So finally, she looked up and said, uh, were you talking to me? She said, yes, ma'am, your card says Miss Williams, and uh, I was asking for Miss Williams. She said, which card did I give you? Because she had a whole handful of stolen 
credit cards with so many different names on them, she didn't remember which name she had given. Man comes home 2 o'clock in the morning. Wife says, where you been? Now, because he'd been somewhere and he had no business, he's about to get involved in a treacherous course of dialogue that only gets worse. He said, I was at James' house. That's lie number one. <laughs> and a sister with discernment will ask some follow-up questions. What were you at James's house for? He owed me some money. That's lie number two. Had to tell lie number two to prop up lie number one. And here discernment comes. What did he owe you money for? Now he's got to tell lie number three to prop up the first two lies. And then a real sister with discernment will wait a whole week later. And say, where you say you were the other night? I was with Frank and them. That ain't what you told me the other night. You said you were with Jane. Now, I'm not sending you home to perform interrogations. But I am warning you, slick folks, that you ain't that slick. All right, let me push it a step further. And again, the language of the text is harsh. So the language of the message may sound harsh. Point number one, you ain't that slick. Point number two, you aren't that dumb either. Here's what I'm getting at. Don't play dumb. Don't, don't, don't play dumb like your slickness can be excused away. Some people say, uh, Pastor, uh, all right, you caught me. I'm slick. I'm a rascal. I'm riffraff. I'm trifling. But the reason I am all those things, here's what some people say. First of all, my ways are inherited. Pastor, it's not my fault. I don't want to be like this. I didn't ask to be like this. I inherited this. Where did you get it from? They'll tell you. Some will say, Pastor, I got this from my parents. Pastor, my daddy was low down. That's why I'm, a, I'm low down. Pastor, my mama was trifling. That's why I'm trifling. I inherited this from my parents. Let me warn you of something. You might have had some trifling people. But you can only blame them for so long. But now when you were still living at home under their roof, following their rules, they were trifling, you were in a trifling situation. But now you're 35. And you're playing some of the same games that they played. You can't keep blaming that. Oh, mom and daddy, tell my pastor, it's hereditary. No, it ain't. Pastor, the acorn doesn't fall from the tree. That's true. But sometimes when the acorn falls from the tree, it hits a hill and starts rolling. And what you need to do, even though you may have fallen from a poison tree, you need to hit a hill called Calvary and keep rolling until Jesus makes you better than what you have ever been. So some folks say, my ways are inherited. I inherited my ways from my parents. Here's something else people say to themselves. Pastor, I inherited my ways from my environment. Pastor, I grew up around cutthroat dodgers, always trying to manipulate the system, always cheating, scheming, conniving, Pastor, it's all I've ever known. It's the only environment I've ever been in. Let me warn you that you've got to learn that when life hands you lemons, you can make lemonade. You don't just have to sit there and suck the lemon. Some of us were dealt some bad hands, but you've got to learn when to throw your hand in and get you some new cards. 
And you can't keep telling yourself that the reason I am the way that I am is because of the environment that I came up in. Here's a third misdirection or mischaracterization mischaracter that people give about themselves. Some will say, Pastor, my ways are inherited from my parents or from my environment. Some will say, Pastor, my ways are inherited from my experiences. And here's what they mean by that. Preacher, I didn't get this way overnight on my own. But because I got mistreated so much, I became cutthroat to keep up with the cutthroat people around me. See, Pastor, here's what some folks say. See, Pastor, you don't know how many men messed over me. And, and the reason I'm trifling now, Pastor, is because I'm going to get them before they get me. Because, you know, I, I, I've been, Pastor, you don't know how, how many times I've been dogged out. How many times I've been cheated on. So because I've been cheated on, now I'm going to be the cheater on earth. I'm going to get them before they get me. And you tell your, and, and you have developed a theology to the extent that you will sit up in church and say, you know what? Whatever I hear in church, I got a file that I'm going to put it in. But when I leave here, I'm going to do what comes natural to me. And church folks are just going to have to understand. Pastor, sometime I got to drop it like it's hot. Because I, I, I grew up in a household where you couldn't wear makeup, you couldn't go to the movies, couldn't go to the club. So Pastor, now every chance I get, get it, get it, don't stop, get it, get it. Riding your horse to the old town road. And <laughs> ride till you can't no more. <laughs> and got children watching you. Boo, you grown now. Now you grown. Now is not the time. Sir, for your Mr. T starter kit. <laughs> All in the mall, shirt, button open way down the hill. Cocoa butter on, glistening. Like, cuz, cuz, you, you grown and greasy. Your seatbelt won't even stay on. All that oil you got. Happening. So some people say, Pastor, I got this way from my experiences and because I've been taken advantage of. Somebody right in this room right now. I don't know who you are. I think it's somebody right in here. <laughs> I don't know who you are. You asked for a day off on your job. They didn't give it to you. Somebody else got a day off. They didn't give you yours. And you walk on those people's jobs every Monday morning saying that you're going to do any and everything you want on their dime. They're paying you to do one thing. And you say, I'm going to make all the personal phone calls I need to make. I'm going to steal all the copies I need to steal. I'm going I'm to spend as much time online as I want to spend non-work related, and you come to church every Sunday? Don't nothing convict you when you come to the Lord's house to make you do better when you leave the Lord's house? Pastor, I'm just doing the bare minimum. He complained about my rice being all stuck together. Pastor, I don't care how the rice turn out. It's going to be lumps in the grits, lumps in the gravy. I don't care no more, Pastor. Who you think you're hurting? The Lord sees you. I'm, I'm just tired. 
I'm, I'm tired. I ain't, I ain't doing this no more. Ain't no more fabric softener in the laundry. You don't put as much detergent in there as you used to. You don't wash the dishes like you used to. Pick up a fork, it still got grains of rice stuck in it. You say to them, all that don't kill you will fatten you. Go ahead and eat. That's extra. Go forward in Jesus' name. And the Lord is saying, is there nothing about your walk with Christ that corrects you to do the right thing because it's just the right thing to do? You know where most pastors fall I don't mean where most pastors make mistakes. Uh, I mean on a scale where most pastors fall is either at a place of frustration or laziness. Some pastors are frustrated because they want to lead their churches, but they don't have churches filled with loving, cooperative sheep. They have churches filled with mean, disrespectful, stubborn goats. And the pastor gets frustrated. Anything the pastor wants to do, somebody's got to complain about it and, and doesn't want to do it. Uh, a, a new pastor went uh, to a church. Half the church wanted him. The other half of the church didn't want him. Uh, and in the very first business meeting, he said to them, he said, the Lord has placed it upon my heart uh, that we need to purchase a chandelier. And one of the members who didn't want him there jumped up in the business meeting and said, See there? I told y'all that we didn't need to call him to be our pastor. Here he is in his very first business meeting, and he wants to spend us money. And worse than that, he want to buy something that don't nobody in here know how to play. <laughs> he said, ma'am, we got enough instruments, but we could stand a little more light in this place. And a lot of pastors across the world are frustrated because they're trying to do their work and cannot get the level of cooperation that they're so desperately desiring. The opposite end of that spectrum is pastors who are lazy. Who say, you know what? They don't want to follow my leadership. I'm going to show up every Sunday. I'm going to show up every Wednesday. I'm going to get a check. But I'm going to pull a message off the internet. And read it to them on Sunday morning. Lazy. And both of them wrong. Church is wrong too. Thankfully, Sister Kendra, I don't have that problem. Because y'all pastors ain't got good sense no how. Because I don't do well with frustration. I can't stay frustrated long. I can't. Because mm -mm. things that frustrate me need to change. Because I don't, I don't like being frustrated. If for some reason y'all got mad and said, we ain't giving no money. I sell the stuff in here. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> Keyboard, organ, drums, projectors, chairs, the van. Y'all come in here, won't be no seats. I said, Did you bring your own chair. So what happened to the pastor? said, y'all didn't put it in the plate. <laughs> so he put it on eBay. <laughs> Y'all pastors a trip. Thug that for Jesus. But I'm, I'm working on it in Jesus' name. Some people say, my ways are inherited. Hey, let me give you a second thing that people say. Because one of the things they say is, my ways are inherited from my parents, from my environment, from my experiences. Let me give you a second one that folks say, my ways are harmless. My ways are harmless. Some people convince themselves that their triflingness doesn't bother anyone who really matters. Some of us, some of y'all cousins, it's 
trifling. He said, as long as I ain't hurting nobody in my family. You do know, ma'am. You do know, sir. You reap what you sow. And what you put in the ground, you may not be reaping it yourself, but one day your kids. Somebody got to see this stuff again, because just as sure as you put it in the ground, it's coming up again. It's not harmless. It's, it's not harmless. She don't even know I spend more time with her husband than she do. But she don't know won't hurt her. What you don't know going to kill you. Because you might not know, you just might be a team member. You, you, you might just be one on the team. Because there's some stuff out there now that grandma's soap and washing powder can't get off. <laughs> so, so, there's some folks in here grew up in the 60s and 70s. And if you had a problem in the 60s and 70s, they had a clinic. And you could go to the clinic and get a shot. It's some stuff now that doesn't even require the transfer of body fluids, just skin to skin contact. You don't know what you're bringing home. But you tell yourself it's harmless. You hurting a whole lot of people because they kids can see. They kids can see. Mama, m m something about mama done changed. See, a lot of folks don't know this, but, but psychologists have, read Cosmo. Psychologists have laid out things that people do when they are trifling. Somebody, it's going to be your last time. It is. Here's one of the things they say when people are trifling and being dishonorable in relationships. They join a gym. <laughs> Can I say it like I feel it? Because they don't want to be fine for the one they already got. But the one they're trying to get, they want to get fine for. So they join the gym. There's another thing they do. They start dressing differently. All of a sudden, they come home. I was say, where, where did that come from? Here's what she says with her mouth. Oh, I just picked this up. Here's what she's saying in her heart. <laughs> this ain't for you. <laughs> I did not buy this for you. I am not wearing this for you. Here's the third one. Their patterns start changing. All of a sudden, they're taking showers at odd times. Just walking. Now, you've been walking in for the last 10 years. Now, all of a sudden, you do. Oh, it's, it's just so hot. It's been hot. What you washing off? You think can't nobody tell. You think don't nobody know. And you think your ways are harmless. So I told you I was breaking this into two main pieces. That, uh, please come back next Sunday. Some <laughs> First piece, you ain't that slick. Second piece, you are not that dumb either. And you can blame it on your ways. And you're doing the wrong thing. Some say my ways are inherited. Others say my ways are harmless. Here's the last thing and I'm done. I want you to know God sent me by here to tell you your ways are hated. So turn around. God hates what you're doing. Minister Lawson, for the longest time, I have been trying to preach from Amos chapter 1. 
uh, the language of Amos chapter 1 uh, is so direct and harsh until I said, Lord, that's, that'd be rough to, to preach Amos chapter 1. Because God tells them how they got on his nerves and how many times they got on his nerves and what he was going to do to them as a consequence. I said, Lord, that's, that's rough right now. He said, well, Thorpe, look deeper into the text. Uh, and instead of preaching Amos chapter 1, find out what the people in Amos chapter 1 were doing that rubbed me the wrong way. That's what God said. What were the people in Amos chapter 1 doing that rubbed God the wrong way? Which means, Thorpe, tell your people what I hate. Why? So they can turn around. Pastor, if you never tell them what I hate, they will stay in it and it will lead to their ruination. But if you warn them, it can turn them around. I said, Lord, but will they come back next Sunday? He said, you let me worry about next Sunday. <laughs> I said, I'm rolling with you, Jesus. I'm going to ride my Bible to the old town road. And I'm going to read till I can. <laughs> Have mercy, Lord. If you don't know that song, look it up when you get on. Billy Ray Cyrus is one of the other things. That some other guy named X. I forget. The, Na, was it Naz or Nas? No, oh, it's too, too well. <laughs> oh, don't say Naz. Don't say Naz. It's Nas. Nas X. And Billy Ray. <laughs> I love y'all so much. Y'all so gangstered out for Jesus. Nas. No, I'm going to bring him next Sunday sing that thing at church. I'm going to switch up the words. Ride the Holy Ghost to the old town road. Pray till I can't no more. This, this is going to be praise and worship next Sunday. Here's verse 16 through verse 19. God says, Thorpe, tell the people what I hate so they will turn around. Take away all of the excuses they have been giving to themselves and encourage them to turn around. Here's verse 16 through verse 19, and I'm done. Here are six things God hates and one more that he loathes with a passion. Here's the first one. Eyes that are arrogant. The King James Version says, a proud look. You ought to be confident, but there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence says, I know who I am because of who God has made me. Arrogance says, I'm better than you. Get out of my way. And God says, I can't stand you with your dusty self. Because he created us from the dust of the ground. He could have made us out of gold, silver, platinum, diamond, rubies, emeralds. He said, no, I, I, I'm going to make them out of something to keep them reminded that it doesn't matter how high they get, they'll still be looking up to me. And anytime you are always looking up to God, you don't have time to look down on other people. Because every one of us in here is one decision away from your world turning upside down. I remember going through a period not of financial difficulty, but a period of financial transition. was also going through a major life transition. And it affected my credit score and credit history, which was a problem I had never had before. But Josh... Uh, on one of my credit cards, it had a zero, all of my credit cards had zero balances. But one of the cards, my credit was so tight. One of the cards had a $29,000 credit limit. I could walk in any dealership, any uh, mortgage office, get whatever I wanted just by giving them my name. But some stuff happened. 
And all of a sudden, wouldn't nobody give me nothing? I shared with you recently, my own bank wouldn't even give me a secured credit card. That's a credit card that in order for you to get it, you have to give them your own money first. I applied for a $500 secured credit card. That's where I hand them $500, say to them, put this in the account, and then give me a card to spend my own $500. They say, we ain't giving you that. Couldn't even rent a red box movie and keep it overnight. Had to bring that thing back in an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> what are you getting that thought? The tables can turn. One day you're riding high. You don't know. One hospital stay. One lost job. One lawsuit. One family tragedy. And it can turn your world upside down. So don't walk around here with your head up in the clouds. Your nose so tooted up. Like you sniffing the stratosphere. That's what's wrong with the ozone layer. You, 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 you the cause of global warming. Global warming. You done sniffed up all the ozone. Nose so high. So the first thing God says he hates is eyes that are arrogant. That's a proud look. God says, I can't stand you when you walk around like you better than the people who are around you. Because you never know who you're going to need. You got to be careful how you treat people in here because you might break down out there and need a ride to the gas station. Be careful how you treat people. You don't know who God is going to use one day. God says he hates eyes that are arrogant. Then he says he hates a tongue that lies. God says he hates it. A lying tongue. He can't stand the fact that you will tell somebody something that is not the truth. Because you desire to mislead them. Here's a third one. God says he hates hands that murder the innocent. People who hurt people on purpose as if people don't matter. Here's the next one God says he hates. A heart that hatches evil plots. Some of y'all hang out with some people and some of the stuff they say is so evil. And you wonder sometimes, where did they get that from? So I'm tired of these stray dogs and cats that hang out around my neighborhood. Well, you know, if you feed them a bowl of antifreeze. Huh? Do you know antifreeze, the technical or, or chemical composition, is called ethylene glycol? Uh, because of my years of working as a diesel mechanic, I've spent a lot of time around antifreeze. Antifreeze used to be sweet. Sweet to the taste, uh, so that uh, if an experienced mechanic, this sounds weird, but experienced mechanics, if you bring them your vehicle and it's leaking, an experienced mechanic can look at the leak and tell what the leak is. If it's a dark brown uh, leak, it's normally engine oil. Uh, if it's a leak with a reddish tint, uh, it's normally transmission fluid. If it's a clear uh, leak, it could be brake fluid. But if the, the uh, leak is clear and appears to have a watery texture, it could either be condensation from your air conditioning system uh, or it could be a leak from your coolant system. And what experienced mechanics would do would be to stick their finger in the leak and taste it. And if it had a sweet taste to it, they knew that it was antifreeze and not condensation from your air conditioning system. But people found out that ethylene glycol was poisonous. And because of that sweet taste, 
I don't know if you watch Snap or Forensic Files. People would take ethylene glycol and pour it in the substance like iced tea, and the person drinking it didn't know what they were drinking and died. So now they have taken the sweetness out of ethylene glycol for that only single reason. So that people won't use it to kill folks. That means that so many people were killing folks with antifreeze until antifreeze manufacturers had to change the taste of antifreeze. And God says, what kind of mind do you have that you sit around and think up something like that. Putting Benadryl in your kids' food so they can go to sleep so you can party. Lord say, I'm so tired of you. Drug, <laughs> drugging these poor children. God says... He hates a heart that hatches evil plots. Then he says he hates feet that race down a wicked track. These are people who run to get involved in negativity. His next thing he says he hates, a mouth that lies under oath. God says I can't stand somebody who would swear or affirm to tell the truth and then still tell bold-faced lies. God says, I can't stand you. Why? Because the truth is always a better alternative. Here's the last thing God says he hates. Now watch this. Uh, remember when the, the text begins uh, in verse 16, it says, here are six things that God hates and one more that he loathes with a passion. Here's the last one. A troublemaker in the family. God says, if you really want to get under my skin, you read it in the King James Version, it says, one who sows seeds of discord among brethren. People who try to tear up families. That when something is going well, you're not satisfied with it going well. You want to tear it up from the inside out. And God says, I can't stand you. You make me sick. He hates it because God is a God of peace. He's a God of order. He is not a God of confusion. He is not a God of disorder. And when you take disorder everywhere you go, because there's some slick folks in there. They think they're slick. But God sees you. And we see you too through the spirit of discernment. Here's the great news. You can turn around. Turn around. Tam, when I was in the sixth grade, I'm done. When I was in sixth grade, but Rick, you can play something softer. That lets them know I'm really uh, done. <laughs> I was in the sixth grade, and I received what they call at that time a scholarship warning. That means I, I was about to fail a class. I had a D in the class. I know it's hard for y'all to believe. I know. I know. I had a D in a class, and I had a, uh, they gave me a scholarship warning. But what you were supposed to do with the scholarship warning is take it home for your parents to sign it, then bring it back the next day. The reason the parents were to sign it was to confirm so that the school would know that the parents understood that you were about to fail this class so it wouldn't be a surprise uh, for them uh, when you didn't get promoted or when you got a failing grade at the end of the nine weeks. So I decided, here's what I told myself, lied to myself. I said, my mom and them don't need to be traumatized by this scholarship warning. I'm going to hold this from them. Slick, so I thought. Conniving, so I thought. So I took scholarship warning. My mom still does this to this day. Her giving envelope, she fills them out in advance. She got a whole stack of them at her house right now. And on the bottom of those envelopes is where she would sign her name. And so I took one of those giving envelopes and I laid it next to the scholarship warning. 
And I decided I was going to practice writing my mom's signature. And so I started writing. And then it didn't look right. And then Sister Joanne, two things dawned on me. Number one, unless my mama had epilepsy, the way that signature looked, the teacher wasn't going to accept it. Then it dawned on me, Sister Brenda, I was writing in pencil. Grown folks don't sign stuff in pencil. I'm like, you're trying to be so slick. You ain't slick. So then I say, well, what I'm going to do is, Brother Isaiah, I thought I knew something. I said, well, I'm going to write in ink on top of the pencil, then go back and erase the pencil, and it'll just leave the ink. Paper don't work like that. So now I got this paper all jacked up, half pencil, half ink, erase marks everywhere. And I still needed it signed. So finally I walked in there to her. I said, yeah, mama. She said, what's that? I said, scholarship morning. I got a D in the class. She said, what's this down at the bottom? I said, I was trying to sign your name. I don't remember anything that happened after that. I think it was. I think it may have been March when I finally regained consciousness. Everything, really, everything else is a blur. I don't even. But the Lord was teaching me, you ain't, you ain't that slick. You ain't that slick. You ain't that slick. And we're living in an age where parents are very busy. We talked about this last Wednesday night. We're living in an age where parents are very busy. And sometimes children are left with more time than we had when a lot of us were coming along. I wasn't a latchkey kid. When I got home, somebody was always there. Uh, but now we got, you know, latchkey kids where people, where kids come home and, you know, nobody else is there. And so now children have to learn how to police themselves. So kids know, you, you, need to, you need to know from your pastor that you ain't that slick. God sees you. Other people see you too. And no need of making excuses because you know better. And when you know better, you ought to do better. And that's for the kids. Some of us work on jobs where people don't stand over our shoulders all the time. You don't think they're standing over your shoulder all the time. But they got ways of knowing what you're doing. And it's stuff you did three months ago. You don't even know it. They put a letter in your file. They're just waiting on you to do the next thing. Because they're waiting on their nephew to graduate from college so they can give them your job. But they got to keep you there long enough to make you think it's all good. So when nephew gets out of college, you can train him. And then six months later, nephew got your job. You ain't that slick. Grown folks on these jobs, you ain't that slick. They, they watching you. They know what you're doing. You ain't that slick. God sees you. You see you. Sometimes you got to self-correct. And in your personal life and in your walk with God, don't be what God hates. 